All right, yeah, YouTube start now. Okay, uh, I think you can start, uh, Mr. Millen, yeah. Yes. All right. There we go, yeah. Millen, feel free to start. We appreciate you coming in. Uh, you know, uh, you're talk gonna talk about some of the inequality initiatives you work on and all that, so uh yeah go ahead and get started sure yeah so when i mentioned about financial inequality this struck very close because we work very closely on this uh let me break this in a step-by-step -step basis so usually what we talk about financial inequality is usually mistaken as income inequality but it's just a subset of what financial inequality is in my personal opinion and i'm pretty sure a lot will echo the same concerns and feelings it's probably the worst form of deprivation. It's more than just an equality. Because when we talk about income inequality, it could be temporary. It could be fixed over the years. But financial inequality affects generational uh, issues. And at the same time, it's way beyond people's individual control. It's something that's affecting society at large. And it's something that people can try to change. But unless everybody comes together, it cannot change. It's not like shifting a job or shifting a country and then your income level changes. Uh, it has... a a longer effect and an adverse effect on many things, including education, healthcare, nutrition, and most importantly, the opportunity to grow. So if I put this in perspective overall, how does this affect look into the human nature? Human nature, people, when they make money through salary, through business, their usual intention is the immediate expenses, let's say a rental fee, price for money that you pay for your food, your travel to work or to university, basic expenses, taking care of your family, saving some amount, protecting your future from uncertainty. Now, how financial inequality affects is you're already in a situation where you're not at the same uh, financial stability as somebody else would, and rather at a disadvantage. This makes people spend less, so you might not be able to get the best form of education because sometimes it's expensive. Uh, not, not saying that everything expensive actually means equality, but usually quality most of the time people have priced it high so people are sometimes skipping basic regular health checkups just something to keep it very basic because they feel something which they will have to spend more money on. emerging countries emerging and developing countries have an issue of not having a central scheme of uh, insurance and healthcare policies which also avoid avoids people you know their expectations and they try to stay away from any expense that because they think would eventually affect them in the long run and saving money. So putting financial inequality something as the cause of a lot of issues and an effect of itself, it has a very self-fulfilling problem. If you take it investment-wise, people that have less amount to spend would probably put in less amount and then what they get in return is pretty less. And this keeps building in. And eventually this leads to a lot of, lot of issues. Unfortunately, people think it's only affecting those who are uh, with the lesser ability of stability. However, it affects every one of them. Let's give a very general example. In a country in Asia or Africa, in a village, if 90% people would be considered financially weak, big businesses, whether it is, unfortunately, hospitals shouldn't be a business, but hospitals, education centers, big shopping malls, they will not come up there. Even for the 10% that actually have the ability to spend, they would not be able to actually access such resources. So this is a larger problem, which unfortunately has been diluted over the period of time, where it's become something that only a few people think it's not about us, it's about others. We are pretty safe, but you are, but how much is the question. And do you really want to be in a society where a lot of people are lacking basic uh, requirements it's not going to be sustainable in the long run. So in a way to resolve this, that I, obviously I'll lead into how blockchain can actually help and what ICP in, in itself is doing, but how this resolves is actually a general upliftment of every route and every level. It's a very symbiotic relation. It's, it's not about one versus the other, which again, unfortunately has been politicized and a lot of people put it that way, but both ways. You know, you need quality people getting paid quality-wise, having a good financial standard. At the same time, you need good companies that can provide so this whole concept that, oh, we need to like maybe just go after one particular financial group of people to help the other. It's not going to work out. 
You need big companies that can provide more job. They need grow, growth opportunities in different countries so they can hire more people. They can, and again, we must not forget some of these houses run on these salaries that they get. So it's a very symbiotic relation that can be pushed and you know, not looking to financial inequality as only as I get paid less or he gets paid more. It's it's more than that. It's about what are the parents of that person getting in case he needs to provide for them? What are the kids getting? What kind of education? Are they having a good future? Are they able to achieve, let's say, a good vacation? Because it's not always about working hard. It's also about relaxing and giving your body and mind some rest. So leading that into blockchain, how blockchain actually helps in general, or it can help, is one of the biggest thing is it's opening new doors. Blockchain today has roughly two, 3% uh, adoption in the entire world, which means it has a very, very high adoption possibility. So when that is a much higher job opportunity for people, much higher options to like invest, much larger options to like which again creates new jobs. So it's more of a direct and an ind indirect effort. But along with that, something that's always able to like really talk much about it is how decentralization helps. So financial inequality comes from multiple aspects. Uh, again, income inequality being one of the aspects comes from zones, which place a person is working. The Web2 world, as we like to call it in the Web3 world, is more about location centric. If you're in X country, you might get an X level of salary. If you're in Y country, you might get another level of salary. This usually takes into consideration the taxes, the expense of the country, which in a way is fair. But again, most companies would prefer paying people for performance rather than location. So in that case, this is where decentralization comes in. What you work really needs to reflect at in the results and the payment options also should be reflecting based on that. So decentralization has not only brought the world together, but today a person sitting in New York, somebody sitting in a village in Kenya, a village in India, or a big city in somewhere in Japan could be on the same page making similar income. Definitely not the same because it's very difficult to maintain that. But at the same time, accessing a lot of services that they probably wouldn't be able because before it was very restricted and very location-centric. Besides that, the good thing is blockchain has a lot to offer. Almost every project offers grants. They offer other opportunities for people to move ahead. And these things eventually fit in. So keeping this in a very smaller opening, just so I could focus on what we as the Internet Computer Protocol are doing, um, this is something which is very core to us because we are a not-for-profit foundation. And unlike many other layer ones, we do not have a for-profit wing. And this explains why we are more for equality because it's not about making money for us. It's not about creating because whatever we do goes back into the and empowers the community to move to different levels. So just a quick intro of what we are and what we do is like, obviously, you know, this has been mentioned a few times. We're a major layer one, but at the same time, what we want to do is we want to be a major layer zero. So now being layer zero also leads into the addressing of the financial inequality part at a large extent. And besides that, what we have is a lot of technical advantages that we've been building on. We have the most uh, equipped research and development department. In fact, we're one of the largest employers of cryptographers and developers. So unlike other chains or many chains that just have a bunch of engineering resources, we've got a bunch of research resources and excellent PhD cryptographers, ex-Apple, ex-Google, ex-IBM, those who've worked very in depth in this industry for a long time. And how does this really help? One must not forget, it's not just about building a project and then forgetting it, right? The project needs to function. It needs to have all the support that that project would need not only now, but three, four, five years down the line. Why this is also important is it's just not a project. It's the hard work of a lot of people who have the vision. It's running the household of a lot of employees. And at the same time, this is in directly running a lot of ecosystem. When we start seeing projects from a more human basis and then more than just a company, that's where the inequality starts getting addressed. These are all people who put in time and money. There are people who depend on the output of these projects. So some of the key advantages that we've brought, technically speaking, and why this links, and I'll link it again uh, to the inequality part, is 
let's say we've got something called as the HTTPS outcall where we've eliminated Oracle's aspect directly serving web two, uh, avoiding hacks. Uh, we've had zero percent downtime ever since we've gone live. Everything on ICP is stored on ICP, and because of that, again, lack of dependency on any other third party helps us help our projects move better and faster. Besides that, we've had a native integration of Bitcoin recently, which again is very, uh, it's, a, it's a very big milestone because at this point, now we can serve advanced, advanced smart contracts on Bitcoin acting as a there too, reducing the transactional speed and increasing the speed um, immensely. Things like this, uh, we've got a lot of projects running on us, again, decentralized, which also acts as decentralized finance, decentralized social media. So trying to provide a Web3 version of everything present in the Web2 world. We've got something called as an open chat, social media chatting platform, but you can even transact your crypto through that. You've got something as a hot or not, you've got something as a candy store, which is, let's say, the Web3 version of a lot of Web2 companies where intellectual property rights are not very well maintained without naming anyone here. Uh, besides that, this also creates a lot of employment sources for a lot of native or local uh, creators where they usually would be lost in this big world where you need to be under a big brand name, you need to be under uh, some big guidance as per se and losing almost 70 to 80% of what you should be getting. So these are some things that we've built and we're actually increasing to build at this point of time. And how does this help? That would come to be the main question. That is it just pitch of the tech or how is it really helping the society? So if you go one by one, in the layer zero, what it also does is it provides you, I mean, once we get there, it provides you an opportunity to like merge into the internet computer, no matter where you are on which chain, therefore helping you to run a business that is more sustainable. When you run a sustainable business, you run the entire ecosystem. You've got communities, you've got employees, you've got families depending on it. And they could be more safer, more happier when the uh, the company runs. These technical advantages also provide a sense of stability. Besides this, what we do is we have a lot of grants program, and our grants program is very strict. It's completely based on what you want to deliver rather than the market. And this is very key. Uh, what's had been a problem in the Web2 world is the developed economies obviously have a bigger share everywhere. So when a project comes from a developed economy, they usually got the benefit of having a stronger market. We don't look into the market, we look into the tech. So you could be a person, again, you could be a developer somewhere related to the Wall Street in the US or a farmer in South Africa. If your, if your project is technically sound, we would pick you. And that would not take into consideration what business would come. Because again, we're not in this for the business. We're not really a profit foundation. So in that case, this is a very big form of equality that we've been trying to push, that it's completely on merit and nothing else. Now, another question arises, how do we actually be sure that the people in the not so privileged region have the equality to apply for such products? So in that case, we have something, uh, well, a whole set of educational tools so we provide free educational materials online. There are a lot of dev houses that are also helping with the free workshops and events, uh, helping these people to learn, which in other cases would obviously need a lot of money. Now, blockchain and ICP, we cannot solve what the government needs to do. Now, we can't provide you internet everywhere, but assuming you've got good internet and a, or a decent internet, uh, that would be possible. Again, this is why I mentioned earlier, financial equality is much different from income inequality. You can control which job you work up to a small level, but you really can't control if you have good internet connection in your region. So that's something which is very key. Moving on from that, we have a very strong onboarding process of a lot of projects that are technically strong. We have a lot of community engagement across the globe, and we are focusing very highly on emerging markets, all the developing economies, uh, giving a lot of scope to people that otherwise would probably lack the opportunity because before it was a matter of travel. You needed to travel to an X amount of place and then you were in touch with the bigger foundation. We have gone out to reach people in different countries, setting up hubs in different regions where they interact with local developers, local community, address their problems, chat requests, send them over, and then make sure that these people are getting what they deserve because it's not that we give a grant and we're doing a favor. This is basically your hard work. It's something you definitely deserve. So coming from there, 
we actually have moved towards a lot of things that eventually would be rolled out, localized, that helps address financial inequality because this is all about opportunity. Once we can provide growth opportunities to people in the coming years, not 100 years down the line, but maybe two years down the line, that's where the problem is going to be solved. When people will feel more stable about their future, then they will start making more bolder decisions. Then they might want to go to that school they really thought, or send their kids maybe to school where they really thought they should have, because now they're very positive and very optimistic about their future. They might actually want to opt for that health care that they were missing, missing. And again, the debate or the discussion on financial inequality should never remain just around money. That's why it's not a monetary inequality, it's a financial inequality. It's it's one problem leading into a lot of problems and a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Me personally coming from an industry, uh, I feel very happy that we are actually pushing this initiative all across Asia and emerging economies because while some of us do very good, we're fortunate enough, there are a lot of talented people, hardworking people that get left along the way. And for us as a humanity, you know, for mankind to grow, we shouldn't just move ahead with just a bunch of people because then again, it's going to be a problem. Uh, and this is a question that's always been there. Again, unfortunately, it's been diluted in a way where somebody, let's say, making a million dollars complaining about not having equality to that making $10 million, it's nothing compared to somebody who doesn't have its basic rights or the basic uh, living standards and just fighting to make ends meet. So that's where the focus should be. And us... Definitely, art is committed to all this. We have targeted regions, and we are moving ahead with a lot of global approach and not a one cap fits all. So we see a country, we see its issues, we see what we can help. Obviously, we're not the government. We're not in the business of affecting or influencing government decisions. Uh, we are a not for profit foundation, completely with tech in the focus. So we're not obviously dealing with NGOs or anything, but we're dealing directly through our hubs for people who want an opportunity to build something that could define their future, possibly define the future of a lot of people and move ahead from that. I'll actually keep it short. So if there's any questions from your side, Scotty, I'd be more than happy to answer. I appreciate that. Uh, I guess um, any any questions from the audience? Uh, you know, if you're on Zoom or if you're in the room, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And we can let you unmute in Zoom or bring you the microphone if you're in IB 1046. All right, uh, guys, do we have any questions? If yes, uh, raise your hands. Uh, I'll approach you with the microphone. Uh, no questions for now from IB room, I think. All right. I don't see any questions from the online audience either. Um, I guess I'll go and throw one out there. Uh, so, Milan, you talked about the generational effects of uh, financial inequality. Um, I guess there's a lot of intent or there's a lot of tangible effects that we've discussed uh in your research uh have you ever have you noticed any intangible effects that get left out that should be addressed more frequently yeah one definitely that should be addressed it gets touched is the psychological effect the lack of confidence when you if i just put this in a very rough crude way the way we always saw this those who came from a stronger financial background at universities or even if they went for jobs, they were a lot more confident in their approach. And that confidence, again, the self-fulfilling prophecy that I mentioned, it also helped them get better results or at least take those risks, which were not as risky as it seemed, but the psychological effect of coming from a financial inequality background is usually overlooked. Uh, it has these tangible effects that we said, but that lack of confidence, the willingness to do something, but again, always fearing, what if it goes wrong? I only have, have that, let's say that 100 buck or the 10 buck, can I take this risk? This is very, very challenging because if this happens, people will not be able to take the next step. And if they don't take the next step, they're 
when we say, you know, somebody is like a year behind, then they're probably two years behind. And this keep happening till the divide gets bigger. So the psychological effect of this needs to be addressed in a very serious way, because that is what's leading to a lot of these tangible effects. I guess I'll throw out something uh, a little different. Uh, so, Jeff, um, I know that you and Sorter have run a an education company in uh, Uzbekistan. Yeah. I guess uh, why don't you why don't you share a little bit of what you do and uh, you know kind of how it relates to what Milan has talked about. Hmm. Um. Uh, okay, that would be. Uh, interesting, I would say. So in Uzbekistan, it's also uh, quite different. And yeah, to some extent, we also have financial inequality, especially for like younger generation. They are very, very, I would say, scared to even take risk. Uh, uh, but in my case, it was a little different, I guess. Yeah, so the company I run is mostly... Uh, concerned with students, uh, we help them with uh, grad school applications, with uh, undergrad applications, job search, uh, I don't know, all types of services, basically, I would say. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, uh, the situation with finance, I would say, uh, uh, especially young people, young generation, they could be not really uh, ready to take risks and therefore create this gap, I guess, yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions, guys, from, from the uh, auditorium? Okay, I don't see any questions from auditorium for now. All right. I think, yeah, uh, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Milind, uh, uh, for, for your talk, for your time, especially uh, for coming. Uh, so I think uh, we are basically are going to move on. I, I think we don't have any other speaker sessions, right, Scotty, for today? Uh, not live speakers. Oh, yeah. Uh, I see. Yeah, yeah. We have... Well, actually, um, we, we have the two AI workshops. One I recorded, and uh, I will coordinate with that, uh, for that after this. And then the other okay. one is, I think, 9 p.m. That will be the second session for the AI workshop. And that uh -huh. one will be live. Okay. All right, then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, then, Mr. Millin. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, words to say uh, or advice, <laughs> you, 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 can, you can give it, I think. I think yeah. Sure, nothing much, just thanks for having me here. It's really good what you're doing with the educational thing, by the way, because it's important people receive good services, you know, because yeah. that's the important step, getting the right guidance. Just a quick word for everybody there, all the best, and just keep believing in yourself. That's what really matters. Whatever situation you're in now, what you expect to be, just believe in yourself, and things will fall in place. Good luck, everyone. All right. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much, Mr. Kumar. Offices. All right. All right. So looking at the calendar, uh, I see. Uh, so we we now let our participants to continue their hacking uh, their projects. So uh, I'll I'll go around the teams to just make sure that they understand the instructions and that they will be submitting their projects uh, by tomorrow, twelve p.m. And then uh, tomorrow at 12 p.m. or after that, 12.30, we will again gather here in this room because uh, at 12.30, we have uh, a speech by Dr. Lee Jan and Charis. 
so Dr. Li Jiang, he works uh, at, at Amazon as a research scientist, and Charis also is fresh fresh graduate uh, from school in the U.S. And she and Dr. Li Jiang will be sharing their experiences of looking for the job and paving uh, their own career path in the U.S. Uh, they will specifically uh, focus their speech for students currently uh, studying in China and who want to move or plan to move to, to the U.S. Uh, to find their own career path. Yeah. Uh, then at 13.15, we will have uh, Professor Mustafa Misir to talk about on the topic of machine learning. Uh, so at 12 p.m., you submitted uh, your projects, uh, and at 14 o'clock, there will be judging process. So you will each each of your teams must be present, at least one member from the team, here on site at IB uh, 1046 room, and you will pitch in your projects to, to the judges uh, live on site. Uh, last speech uh, before closing the ceremony will take place at uh, 3 p.m. by... Uh, Professor Zhou uh, on topic of machine learning again. And then at 4 p.m., we will have a closing ceremony and uh, announce the winners uh, for the hackathon. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it, I guess, uh, for, for today and for tomorrow, the schedule. For any help, you feel free to reach out to WeChat group uh, as well as you have Notion website if you have any Technical questions, uh, go to mentor office hours, uh, or again, reach us, uh, reach out to us and reach out. Uh, if, uh, maybe we can help you with some technical issues as well. But uh, mentor office hours are also very good resource that I highly recommend you to use and not forget about. Okay, uh, Strolly, do you want to share anything before before we go? Uh, just uh, you know, keep working together. And if you have questions, ask. Uh, we have mentors getting online in a few hours. Uh, we will have the AI workshop, the first half of the AI workshop available soon. And the second half will be available at 9 p.m. And that one will be live. You will join the Zoom room just like you're doing right now. So good luck with everything and we will see you around. All right. Okay, awesome. So yeah, uh, thank you guys. Yeah, see, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah, bye-bye.